a set of updated missiles from Turkey that they were already planning on removing anyway. So in essence, the Soviets kind of blanked here. Why was it solved? The realists would argue that ultimately it was a battle of terror. The bureaucratic politics people would argue that ultimately it was about American superior intelligence, not brain power, but, but you know, uh, like CIA, that kind of intelligence. And also because that ultimately in, in, the, in the United States, the civilians are in charge of the military. And the personality people would say that ultimately, no matter how crazy Khrushchev was, he was ultimately a rational actor who was really uninterested in having World War III. Yeah. No, no, no. Can you still buy the Harvey Oswald? Oh, you mean, do I think there's a conspiracy? <laughs> I don't get into that. I mean, no, it's not. No, I think he was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald. I think there's been a gazillion books written on the subject. You can turn the History Channel back on if you want. Uh, no. He was killed by Lee Harvey Oswald with a lucky shot in the head. Uh, what can I say? Yeah, I mean, sometimes history really is not a matter of uh, a little guy named Oscar with a hot dog stand in New York controlling the entire world. <laughs> sometimes history really just doesn't work out by unstable people grabbing a gun and making it a good shot. That's the way it works. Okay. Um, how do you get out of the prisoner's dilemma? Well, this became one of the interesting outcomes of the early fun and games of the Cold War, which the Cuban Missile Crisis was part of. One is, of course, you let the prisoners talk to each other. Right? You break down that initial condition of separation. Now, in this case, the prisoners are the leaders, and you let them talk to each other, and you create communication. You create a hotline. The hotline exists to this day. You don't really need the hotline in the same way you did it anymore. I mean, you can now just pick up a cell phone and reach anybody anywhere. Uh, but in this day and age, you certainly needed it. So that's number one. You let the prisoners talk. If you let the prisoners talk, they're more likely to cooperate because then they can explain the payoff structures to each other. And arguably, even during the Cuban Missile Crisis, they were doing that during, through back channels. They were explaining intentions to each other through journalists and diplomats. And so in effect, they were trying to break down those initial conditions, which is probably why we didn't have a nuclear war. Number two, you change the payoff structure. You made nuclear war unsurvivable and therefore unthinkable. So what you do is you change all of those boxes Everything to a 10, except for the cooperate one, zero, zero. You understand? You make everything into a 10. You basically get rid of the incentive to launch first. Now that's almost the doomsday device mechanism, right? That's almost that anybody launches first, everybody gets killed everywhere. It doesn't help you to launch first. There is no advantage. So there are all kinds of ways you might think of changing the payoff matrix. One of them, is by avoiding destabilizing weapons. One of the most destabilizing weapons is, well, there are two kinds of destabilizing weapons, I would say. If you think about it from the standpoint of nuclear doctrine. One is a weapon where it's so accurate that it could knock out their weapons. You do a first strike, not to destroy their people, but to destroy their nuclear weapons. And then you can hold them hostage, in essence. 
Then you can say, we've destroyed all your weapons, we have some left, and we're coming after you next if you don't do what we say. A first strike weapon is very destabilizing because it induces the other side to use its weapons before they get lost to the first strike weapon. Use it or lose it. That's number one. The other destabilizing thing, and this was also at the end of the Cold War, is missile defense. Missile defense is highly destabilizing. Why? Anybody over here want to give me an explanation? Yeah. Not quite, because it's, it's close. It's close to that. It does have to do with this protection business. Yes. It intercepts them, but what does that do? Why does that induce them to be used? Exactly. So the idea here is that even the best form of missile defense isn't going to get them all. So, if you have, if somebody launches against you and you have missile defense, you can destroy enough of theirs so that you can then launch the ones that you have left at them. So the best thing to do is to launch yours first. Launch yours first. <laughs> the idea here is that anything which breaks down mutually assured destruction is destabilizing. If the elements that produce stability from nuclear weapons were mutually assured destruction, anything which produces nuclear, which reduces mutually assured destruction, of which first strike weapons and missile events are two good examples, are by definition 